Before we launch into the content, I want to tell you a little bit about um, about us and also about the agenda for the day. Um, so as I mentioned, my name is Tony Dutzik and I work uh, here in Boston with Frontier Group. Um, we are a nonpartisan public policy think tank whose mission is to provide information and ideas to build a cleaner, healthier, fairer, and more democratic America. Uh, and our website is www.frontiergroup.org, uh, at which we have many resources and materials for you. Um, our plan for the day is to be here for one hour, uh, and the first half of the program will be a presentation on the findings and insights uh, from work that we've done here at Frontier Group over the last year as part of our project, A New Way Forward, Transportation and Global Warming, uh, which has been generously supported by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Um, the uh, two reports that we'll be talking about uh, are available as handouts uh, on this presentation in the control panel for the webinar, uh, and they are also available on our website at frontiergroup.org. Uh, and during that project, um, those two reports represent both a vision and a policy roadmap uh, that can contribute toward building a carbon-free transportation system for the future in our cities. Um, and we hope that uh, these resources can be, or that these reports can really be a resource for you uh, in the work that you do at the local, state, and federal levels and uh, in the work that you do in your communities. Um, so the first half of uh, today's webinar will be a discussion of, of those reports and the findings and insights. And then in the second half, uh, we really want to hear from you. Uh, our goal here is to make this an interactive conversation. Um, and we've deliberately invited a broad range of people to this webinar who are active on transportation issues at a variety of different levels, um, as well as members of the general public, in the hopes that we can learn from each other and begin to make the connections and build the momentum that will enable us to make progress in the years to come. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, next steps and also about ways that we can stay connected and lay foundations for continued work. Um, in the process of doing that, we're going to ask all of you to adhere to a couple of ground rules in that conversation, um, especially since we had uh, more than 100 people registered to participate today, in many of whom are, are already online. Um, so first, when we reach the discussion part of the agenda, uh, we're going to ask folks who wish to ask a question or to raise a comment uh, to please raise your hand using the hand icon in the webinar tool. Uh, and my colleague Alana Miller will unmute you when it's your time to speak. Uh, there, everyone is muted for the presentation section of the agenda, but we will be opening it up and, and wanting to hear from folks a little bit later on. Um, alternatively, if uh, for some reason you don't have access to audio uh, or just wish to type your question, uh, you can type it into the chat uh, section of the, um, of the uh, toolbar as well. Um, and I just I wanted to flag for, um, for Alana, who is helping me run this webinar, that there is already a question in the questions box uh, that deals with logistics. So um, I will ask uh, Alana to, to have that conversation uh, while we start the presentation. Um, okay, so that is, that's ground rule number one uh, in the logistics, and um, the second thing that we want to ask folks is to respect our desire to make this a truly nonpartisan forum. Uh, if we are going to decarbonize transportation in the next 35 years, we need to come up with solutions that fit the aspirations of people across the country and from different political points of view. Um, so while I don't want anyone to shy away from the very serious policy challenges that are arising from the new leadership in D.C., um, I do hope that we can transcend that conversation a little bit. I know how hard it is um, so that folks can feel free to, be, to speak and be heard with respect and, and to have a conversation that deals um, more as much with the long term as it does with the short term. So if folks are good with that, um, I wanted to start just by grounding this conversation in a little bit of history, which is going to feel um, kind of like ancient history to some of us, but it's important. Um, so first of all, I just want to underscore that many of the challenges and problems that we face today in our transportation system uh, including its contribution to climate change, have their roots in decisions that were made originally generations ago. Uh, so this is a picture of Henry Ford, and in 1908, Henry Ford introduced the Model T, um, which not only put automobility within the financial reach of the ordinary American and established the precedence of private vehicle ownership, uh, but it also cemented the internal combustion engine as the dominant way of powering those cars. That technological development 
helps propel the construction of a massive capital intensive network for producing, transporting, refining, and distributing petroleum based fuels that now spans the entire world. Eight years later, Congress adopted the first Federal Aid Road Act, which provided federal financial assistance to states for road improvements. And that law established many of the precedents that guide transportation policy today. It insisted that any roads built with federal dollars be toll free, that highway funds flow through, primarily through states and not cities, and that any state receiving funds have a state highway agency staffed with professional engineers. That same year, New York City adopted the nation's first citywide zoning code, which separated the city into zones by uses, residential, retail, business, and other, um, creating a model that was soon adapted by cities around the country. Um, in many places, those new zoning and planning rules made traditional forms of urban development of the kind that didn't rely on the automobile either difficult or impossible. Um, and in many places, those restrictions remain in place today. And lastly, in 1919, Oregon adopted the first state gas tax to pay for road construction. Within 10 years, every state in the nation had created a similar tax, helping to fund a wave of road construction and improvement around the country. So within a dozen years, a century ago, we experienced a series of technological, business, and policy innovations that would transform America over the next century and that continue to shape the way we live and travel today. It's important to recognize that those decisions made some amount of sense at the time. They emerged from the desire of people to do good things and address real problems. And they did create new opportunities for economic growth, recreation, and many other benefits. But as we all know, Americans' adoption of a car-centered transportation system also created tremendous unanticipated problems. The transportation policies that we created to stop trucks from getting stuck in the mud and to knit the country together in 1917 are not necessarily the policies that are going to fix the problems created by our dependence of car on cars over the last century. And they're certainly not the policies that will enable us to take full advantage of the wealth of new technologies and resources that we have to address transportation problems in 2017. Now, there are many reasons to rethink transportation policy in the, in the United States, um, from uh, quality of life to public health uh, to resource dependence, um, you name it. But among the most urgent is the need to, re uh, to reduce the contribution of our transportation system to the warming of the planet. America's transportation system produces more of the carbon pollution that fuels global warming than the transportation system of any other country in the world. In fact, our transportation system produces more carbon pollution than the entire economy of any nation in the world, with the exception of China, India, or Russia. And on a per capita basis, our transportation system produces vastly more carbon pollution than our European and Asian counterparts, and even more than countries such as Canada and Australia that, like us, are geographically large. Any pathway to preventing the worst impacts of global warming, therefore, has to pass through and address the challenges of America's transportation system. What's more, over, after a decade in which Americans used more efficient vehicles and the number of miles driven actually fell, emissions have been rising again from transportation. Last year, for the first time in at least recent history, carbon emissions from transportation exceeded those from electricity production to become the biggest source of carbon pollution in the United States. Transportation in the U.S. has become climate enemy number one. Now, the United States remains, as of right now, uh, committed to the Paris Climate Agreement, in which the vast majority of the world's nations committed to preventing a global temperature increase of more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, which is the boundary, the rough boundary beyond which uh, the world's political leaders and many of its scientists believe that um, serious, dangerous implications from climate change that cannot easily be fixed um, will occur. Meeting the goals of the agreement will require the United States to curb its emissions of greenhouse gases by 80% or more by 2050. Given the difficulties involved in decarbonizing long-distance transportation services like air travel, we need to aim for fully eliminating carbon pollution from light-duty transportation by the middle of this century. So if you take nothing else from this presentation, there are three things that we all need to remember. 
The first thing is that there is no way to get to zero carbon that doesn't involve transformation of our transportation and energy systems to something very different than what we have today. The second is that such dramatic transformations can happen. You need only look back at the lasting impacts of the technological advances and policy decisions from the early 20th century that I mentioned earlier, or to the rapid changes in our economy and lives that have occurred through digital communications in just the last decade. The third, and perhaps most important, is that all the ingredients for transformation to a zero carbon transportation system exist today or can be readily anticipated to exist soon. In our May 2016 report, A New Way Forward, we identified eight elements of a new transportation toolbox that can play a role in making that transformation happen. First, there are electric vehicles, which are becoming both cheaper and better, and which have the potential to be powered by renewable energy. Last year, despite low gas prices, sales of plug-in vehicles increased by 37% in the U.S. And this year, the Chevy Bolt and the Tesla Model 3 are both hitting showrooms, each with a range of more than 200 miles and a price tag of around $35,000. Uh, it's not for nothing that the introduction of the, of the model, uh, the announcement of the Model 3 last year uh, was thought of as sort of an iPhone moment for electric vehicles with more than 300,000 people putting in pre-orders for that vehicle. Second, we've long known that people living in walkable, transit-oriented, and urban neighborhoods tend to take shorter trips and more trips by non-driving modes than residents of sprawling neighborhoods, thereby producing less carbon pollution. Over the last decade, we've seen a resurgence of interest in living in urban neighborhoods, as well as suburban neighborhoods that share some of the same walkable characteristics. The past decade has also seen the emergence of new technology-enabled transportation services, from car sharing services like Zipcar and Car2Go, to bike sharing, to ride sourcing networks such as Lyft and Uber, which combined, along with transit and active transportation, can provide an alternative to the need to own a personal car. Public transportation has also seen increased demand, with ridership in 2014 setting a modern record. In November of last year, several cities in both red and blue states adopted sweeping transit improvement and expansion plans, indicating the intense desire of many people around the country for improved public transportation. Another development over the last decade has been the spread of complete streets, policies, and practices, and the reallocation of space in some cities from cars and parking to facilities for people on foot or on bike. We've also started to see experiments with smart pricing of roads and parking, a set of policies that has proven effective in other parts of the world in reducing transportation demand, congestion, and greenhouse gas emissions. Biking and walking have also grown in popularity, with the number of bike commuters increasing by more than 60% between 2000 and 2013. And lastly, changes in information technology make it more possible than ever for people to live multimodal lifestyles in which they have a variety of transportation options at their fingertips. Now, don't get me wrong. The future progress of each of these new technologies and practices is not assured. Any trend can be reversed, any exciting new business model or technology can fail to thrive or be stifled before it can hit critical mass. And there are tools that I've mentioned, some as some, such as some shared mobility tools like ride sourcing services, for which the jury is still out about their impacts on the climate and on the transportation system as a whole. There are also some changes that I haven't yet mentioned, including autonomous and connected vehicles. Vehicle automation has the potential to make a new, more sustainable transportation system work better or to accelerate the damage done by the transportation system to the climate. Much depends on the decisions that we make regarding how they are used. Um, this chart, which unfortunately I don't think you can see the citation, this is not our chart, but it comes from a, a 2016 study um, that looked at the various ways in which automation could either increase or decrease uh, energy demand from transportation. And as you can see, there are a lot of opportunities um, both to um, use automation to reduce energy demand and greenhouse ga gas emissions and also um, some very real opportunities for, for things to go the other way. These transformative scenarios can only be unlocked if we look at the whole and not just at the sum of the parts. 
Uh, many of us who work in transportation or climate policy tend to focus really intensely on one piece of the picture. Um, but I challenge you, at least for the purposes of this conversation, to think more broadly. You might ask yourself, for example, are there ways in which shared mobility can support electrification of vehicles? Um, a lot of folks who are looking at the connections between sharing automation and electric vehicles, as in this slide from um, Susan Shaheen at, at UC Berkeley. Um, you might also ask yourself uh, how electrification, which eliminates tailpipe emissions, might make it more pleasant or more health conscious to ride a bike in a city. Or how riding bikes can make it possible for us to house more people in a smaller area. Uh, in our cities without having to devote room to parking and the movement and storage of cars. Um, all of these things really do come together and mix together in a variety of very interesting ways. And it's our contention that these synergies unlock powerful new pa potential pathways to a zero carbon transportation system. Uh, the past few years have produced a series of analyses by a wide variety of analysts that suggest that large scale emission reductions consistent with the speed and scale needed to comply with the Paris Agreement are possible in the United States. In our own analysis for a new way forward, we posited that taking maximum advantage of all these trends and technologies could reduce energy demand for urban light duty transportation by as much as 90% in major American cities, in part by reducing growth in vehicle travel, as is illustrated on this slide. That makes it easier for us to imagine how we might repower our transportation system entirely with renewable energy. But if we're going to embrace that potential, there's a few things that we need to let go of. And the first of them is the idea that the pathway is going to be the same everywhere. Uh, America's cities are very different in terms of their history and current form. Um, we're very unlikely to rebuild the entirety of the auto-dependent Sunbelt in 35 years. And we shouldn't rebuild our most compact and transit-oriented cities around the need of, needs of the car, even if those cars are clean, autonomous, and shared. Not only are there likely to be multiple pathways, but there are multiple reasons to pursue a given pathway that appeal to different audiences. The potential for transformation to a low-carbon transportation system is constrained as much by politics and culture as it is by technology. If our transportation solutions don't, to address the climate crisis don't also, to the extent that they can, address the real immediate problems people are experiencing in their lives, our job is going to be a lot tougher. And as we just learned in this election, the problems people experience and the ways in which they understand them vary tremendously across the country and even within communities. And so in our report, A New Way Forward, we developed speculative narratives about how different types of cities might combine these tools to address major current challenges while also moving toward a zero carbon transportation system. We made a conscious and intentional effort to develop scenarios relevant not only to cities on the coasts, but also to the Rust Belt, the Sun Belt, and the rapidly growing urban west. Scenarios that were informed by in-depth conversations with residents, experts, and advocates in those regions. Each of the narratives was built around one or more specific tools in the toolbox, attuned to the specific opportunities and challenges presented in each type of city. Now the implication of all this is that there is no one-size-fits-all plan. The solutions we need, like plants, are going to grow from the bottom up. The seeds of this change, I'm convinced, are already being planted in cities around the country. But for those seeds to mature, they need to be watered and fed and given space to grow. And that brings us to state and federal policy. As I mentioned, our current transportation policy framework dates from a time when global warming was unknown and all but unimaginable. So it should be no surprise that that framework has left us poorly equipped to respond. Despite having historically spent the vast bulk of our transportation capital on high carbon modes of travel, such as highways and aviation, we continue to spend 80% of our federal transportation funds on highways, including highway expansion projects that make achieving our climate goals harder. And in 24 states, we spend less than a penny a person a day in state funds on public transportation. We also spend peanuts at all levels of government on efforts to make places easier to travel on foot or on bike, and on proven tools like transportation demand management that encourage people to make more climate-friendly transportation decisions. It's not an exaggeration to say that on, in many ways and in many areas, our current set of transportation policies make it harder for us to achieve our climate goals rather than make it easier. 
So in our report, 50 Steps Toward Carbon-Free Transportation, we laid out six principles for what transportation policy might look like if the climate really mattered. And those principles really just reflect common sense, that we should be thinking about climate in every transportation policy decision, that we should be putting low carbon transportation solutions at the front of the line for public funding, that we should be rewarding people for making good transportation choices as opposed to subsidizing them for driving, that we should continue to make vehicles and fuels less carbon intensive, build climate friendly communities and embrace innovation. We then proposed 50 specific policy steps that states and federal governments can take to make this happen. The policy ideas included everything from defending and strengthening key policies that are already on the books to sweeping changes in how we finance and plan our transportation, transportation system that may take years or decades to achieve. Now, I won't run through all of those here. Uh, you should feel free to check them out uh, in the report. And I'm also sure that there are some good policy options that didn't make the cut. Um, the report also focuses primarily on urban light duty travel, and there are many other aspects of the transportation challenge, such as emi reducing emissions from freight and from non-metropolitan travel that are also extremely important and that deserve a great deal of attention. Now, we finished the 50 Steps report and published it in October, uh, and in November there was an election, and two weeks ago we had a transition of power in Washington, D.C. And already that transition has put a few policy debates into play uh, that were addressed in the 50 Steps report that are critical for short-term and long-term efforts to address uh, the transportation system's contribution to global warming. Uh, the first of those is the potential reversal by the Trump administration of guidance requiring environmental reviews for transportation projects to include consideration of climate change. Um, now this one to me is, is pretty incredible that while we've known about global warming for decades, until last year, there was no formal federal requirement that we even consider climate change when federal transportation dollars are spent. That requirement, which was imposed by the Obama administration last year, is now in jeopardy. Second, there are a constellation of issues that relate to how we regulate carbon pollution from vehicles. Before leaving office, the Obama administration finalized fuel economy and greenhouse gas emission standards for 2025 that will keep the nation on a trajectory toward more efficient and less polluting cars. But there have been threats of congressional and administrative action that could knock the foundation out from beneath those efforts, including reducing or removing the ability of California and other states to adopt stronger vehicle emission standards when federal standards fail to keep the air clean. The third is the ongoing debate about infrastructure. Uh, now, I'm going to be a little blunt here, uh, which is to say that there's really no way to square a plan to decarbonize transportation, at least right now, with a massive expansion of highway capacity. Transportation research is clear that expanding highways leads to auto-dependent land uses and shapes travel habits in ways that increase automobile travel and undermine alternative forms of transportation. We have generations of experience with how this works in our cities. And it's important, I think, to surface the idea that a modest increase in our investment in rail or transit may not be enough to outweigh it. This is one place where I think it's very important for people who focus on different silos of transportation policy, so vehicles, people, urbanists, transit advocates, and others, um, to begin to look beyond and outside of their specific areas of focus and find ways to work together uh, and see the, the greater good and, and the collective challenge that's at play. Um, there are, of course, important things that are happening in city halls and state houses around the country. Um, and especially in cities, I think you continue to find a great deal of energy around innovation in all aspects of transit, uh, transportation, and urban development. Um, there are really a lot of tremendously exciting things that are happening right now with the challenge of you know, figuring out how they fit together and getting them to scale. But we also wanted to bring up, as we talk about cities and states, um, part of that is why we wanted to bring you all together today. Um, we want to hear from you a little bit about what you see happening in your community, about what parts of this vision are most exciting to folks in your area, about what parts are likely to raise concerns, about the opportunities and policy options that we might be missing and not talking about. If you come from a state where climate change is a difficult or polarizing issue, we want to know a little bit about how you experience all this and what suggestions you have for how to move forward. 
and maybe most importantly, we want to know what opportunities you see to build broader coalitions uh, within cities, within states, uh, and more broadly, that can expand the possibilities for what we can achieve. So with that being said, we want to open the forum for discussion. Um, again, you can feel free to, to raise questions. You can feel free to make comments um, that speak to any of the questions that I've just raised. Um, and again, logistically, if you have anything to say or if you have any questions, um, the way to signal that you do is in the webinar software, um, you can raise your hand uh, and Alana will unmute you. Uh, and then if you are, find yourself unable to raise your hand or if you have not signed into audio, you can also type in a question in the chat box. Thanks, Tony. Um, so with that, we we're going to open it up for questions. Again, you should see in your webinar interface a tiny little hand. Um, and then you should also, if you see a button to click to show control panel, um, it'll pop out a, a box where you could actually just type a question. And I think it'd be helpful um, if folks asking a question, if you want to just briefly say where you're coming from and um, sort of the, the work you do in this field would be helpful. All right, we have a question from Arturo. Um, he's asking, about, given the heated rhetoric of Governor Brown directing at the Trump administration, um, what's the likelihood that Congress would actually eliminate the special status of, that California has under the Clean Air Act? So getting at the question um, of states having their own ability to uh, push the limits on making cleaner transportation. Sure. Um, let me give a little bit of background to that question um, in, in part by way of, uh, of uh, uh, just to give folks who, who aren't familiar with the background here a little bit, a little bit of information. So under the Federal Clean Air Act, um, California uh, was you know, really the place that was the first to experience some of the serious air pollution problems that relate from uh, that relate to um, the explosion of, of automobility. So going back, you know, as far as the late 1940s, um, smog was a serious public health concern in California. And so California, um, even prior to uh, the passage of the Clean Air Act, was regulating pollution from automobiles. So when the Clean Air Act was passed, um, California was uh, enabled to continue to establish its own set of regulations, and then other states that had exper that were experiencing severe air pollution problems um, could essentially choose between whether to enforce California's regulations or those at, at play at the federal level. Um, and over the years, especially in the last decade or so, well, definitely in the last decade or so, that power has come to um, also be extended to greenhouse gas emission standards. Um, and so you know, you, you've had a history in which um, California and the states uh, pioneered a approach to reducing greenhouse gas emissions that was later adopted uh, at the federal level by the Obama administration uh, along with the, uh, with the auto bailout beginning in 2009. Um, there has been some talk about um, you know, both removing California's special status and its ability to regulate air pollution on its own. Um, there are ways in which that can be done um, you know, in, in law and ways that it can be done in practice. In practice, one of the ways that it can be done is for uh, the new administrator of the EPA to take a much harder line in what it will allow California um, to do by way of granting waivers. Um, I can't speak to how likely any of that is to transpire. Um, you know, I think it's a little bit, um, you know, in, in these sort of new and volatile times, it's a little bit uh, challenging to make predictions, but, um, but it is something that I think, uh, I, and I would encourage anyone from California who has, who has better insights on this or folks who work in the vehicle sphere exclusively to chime in on it. Um, but, you know, it is something that is definitely a concern. 
All right, we've got a bunch of questions, so we're going to try to work through them here. Um, we have a question, <clears throat> excuse me, from Margarita asking us, what are the prospects for working on the new infrastructure bill? Um, that is also a, re a really good question. I think that there is still a great deal of, um, of uh, lack of clarity about what the new infrastructure bill will be. Um, there have been a few um, there have been a few different versions of um, a future infrastructure policy that have been floated by the administration during the campaign and more recently um, during the campaign the administration floated a um, what was built as a one trillion dollar infrastructure package but really would have required much less public investment um, with the idea that it would be used to subsidize and spark um, private investment in infrastructure there are I think it's fair to say a lot of questions about what kind of infrastructure that kind of a system would uh, would result in um, you know many questions about the, the fact that in in most of these cases I think the assumption is that it would be paid for uh, in the case of roads through tolls or through other fees on other kinds of infrastructure and that you know very very well may limit the kinds of things that might be built um, there's also been talk of you know more broader actual investment of, of public funds and in infrastructure um, the Senate Democrats I believe came out with a proposal last week um, that, it, that is again a one trillion dollar infrastructure proposal that would be a trillion dollars in public spending um, in which there was very little discussion of highway, at least explicit discussion of highway expansion. Um, there was a great deal of uh, revenue that was intended to be slated for transit and also for roadway repair. Um, the caveat there is that there was also a, um, about one-fifth of that package was dedicated to um, a set of you know, nationally important infrastructure projects to be determined later uh, that could incorporate a whole set of things um, and, and that it's really unclear. So I think the short answer to that question is that there's a lot of uh, really very little clarity about um, about what the Trump administration will propose, about what Congress will accept. Um, you know, remember that there has, was a great deal of pushback um, during the Obama administration to, to stimulus through infrastructure spending. Um, and so, you know, it, it remains to be seen, but it's definitely very important, I think, to be watchful for what might come down the pike and also to, you know, for those of us who, um, who are concerned about climate issues to, you know, continually raise the caution flag about um, investments that would further move us toward, um, you know, carbon intensive and carbon dependent ways of getting around. Um, so we have a question from Lauren asking about how we encourage shared mobility in rural areas. And again, we do want to have a discussion. So if folks who do live in rural areas want to chime in, you could raise your hand and I can unmute you. Um, but Tony, maybe you have some thought, thoughts on that. Um, yeah, I think I'd be more interested in hearing um, in hearing what other folks have to say about it. Um, you know, there has certainly been a variety of of pilot programs that have found pretty unique ways to provide shared mobility service in rural areas uh, from you know services that look a lot like hitchhiking you know things that are much more much more small scale uh, I think this is a place where our definition of shared mobility it's important to include public transportation in that and one of the pieces of speculation about what might happen at the federal level is that there, you know, there has been talk going back a number of years about eliminating the federal government's role in supporting public transportation. And while that is something that would obviously have a tremendous impact in big and transit-oriented cities around the country, uh, it's also something that would have a devastating impact in rural areas and in small cities where the function of the transit network is really you know as much to be part of the social service system as it is to be part of the transportation system um, so I, I think from the rural and small city perspective you know some of the some of the shared mobility pieces are are really great and promising and interesting but in the next couple of years preserving their access to excuse me, to basic public transportation service is also going to be really key. We have a comment, a uh, follow-up from Laura, who says that UC Davis is working with the 
uh, metropolitan planning organizations, eight of them in the San Joaquin Valley in California, is to develop a shared transportation pilot program for rural residents. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, lots of questions here. Um, Some folks wondering just about the, the best resources. I guess I'm going to combine some questions. So a, a best resource for planners um, to know what is happening in different innovations and where they've been successful elsewhere. And then similarly, what people can personally do um, to support mm -hmm. clean transportation. Sure. Uh, I would say on the first, on the first piece, um, there's been a lot of really great work that has been happening uh, and you know, I think folks, some folks from these organizations or other organizations that have been doing this work might be on this call. So um, you should feel free to take this as an open invitation to plug your own work. But um, there, there have been a couple of uh, good pieces of work that have been done. One. Uh, done recently, and I'm going to forget the names of these reports, so I apologize for that. Um, one that came out recently from Transit Center looking at the interactions between uh, between shared mobility and public transportation um, that talked a little bit about some of the pilot projects that have been happening uh, around the country um, in terms of uh, partnerships between public transportation and shared mobility. Uh, the Shared Use Mobility Center, which is based out of Chicago, uh, is a great resource for following the, pro uh, the, the progress of um, some of the pilots. Uh, I know my colleague Michelle Kinman, who is on the line, um, can probably speak a little bit to some of the innovative work that's been happening around uh, around low income shared mobility in California. Um, you know, really, I would say that those are great resources, um, and a number of other organizations. You know, certainly research organizations. You know, following the work of um, the transportation. Uh, Research Sustainability Center, which I'm going to, Transportation Sustainability Research Center at UC Berkeley, um, led by Susan Shaheen, always very good to be keeping up on their work that they're publishing regarding the, um, the environmental and social impacts of new mobility. We are learning a lot as we go, um, and many of these tools are really very new. So it's, it's very important to, to stay abreast. Um, and I would, again, invite anybody else who's on the phone um, to chip in with resources that they know of um, for how people can keep keep in touch on this stuff. Um, on the local transportation bit, you know, I would say, you know, how to how to get involved. Um, you know, there really is no shortage of ways in which to get involved. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, advocacy around. You know, we've seen this tremendous burst of advocacy in my experience around. Uh, active transportation issues of uh, advocacy for pedestrians and bicyclists, which, you know, to me is is a real key of building a zero. It's a real foundation of building a zero carbon transportation system in our cities for people to have the ability to get around in ways that don't involve motorized transportation. So, um, you know, in, in most cities that I know of, there are there are active groups that are working on those issues at the local level. Um, and then certainly, um, you know, at the national level with, you know, with things that are happening in Congress, um, you know, some organizations that are doing advocacy work on that. I know that, uh, you know, our friends at the Natural Resources Defense Council are all over it, um, and other major national environmental organizations are, are going to be winging in on that. Um, the other thing that I just mentioned is that, um, you know, there are many cities in the country that are facing, um, you know, big highway expansion projects. And we've, we've written about that in a couple of reports that we've done um, called Highway Boondoggles that um, are really large scale investments of public resources in infrastructure that is potentially very damaging to the climate and also to our communities. So to give you one example, uh, there is a major multi-billion dollar highway expansion project under uh, underway and, and proposed uh, in and around the Tampa area that, you know, is, is claiming, uh, claiming some areas of the city that have, you know, really experienced a resurgence in, in recent years as places to live. And these are going to be places where there are some real value decisions and value judgments that need to be made, and they're not going to be easy. Um, and so to the extent that people are looking, you know, to the extent that these things are occurring in your cities or in your regions, um, you know, there are almost always local organizations that are working on highlighting those projects uh, and subjecting them to scrutiny that, you know, I would encourage people to, to make connections with. 
And we have a comment from a, a few folks offering resources. Um, so Bill Barker yeah. in San Antonio um, said that he found it helpful to engage corporate members of the community and also the military, um, sort of those unlikely bedfellows to, to help you win campaigns. Um, and then suggest the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, which, which works with corporations as a resource. Um, and then some other folks have suggested places for bikes, um, Strong Towns, Smart Growth America. So definitely a lot of great organizations working on this um, type of work. All right. Um, and if folks have, again, you feel free to raise your hand. I can unmute you. Um, we can also work our way through these um, typed questions. So a lot of folks are having questions about um, trucking and commercial transportation, um, freight and trains. Uh, for this, these reports, we did look at um, city transportation and mostly how people get around to do the things they need to do. But Tony, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that or resources um, about trucking and freight. Uh, I don't, other than, other than to say that, uh, you know, I think work that is similar to, to this work and, and that other folks have been doing to imagine uh, and, and investigate new transportation futures is also direly needed in, in, in the freight world as well. Um, and clearly there are interactions between, uh, between freight and urban light duty transportation that, um, you know, I, I experience every day. Uh, in riding my bike or taking the bus in Boston um, that, that we really do need to, to sort out. So I, I would defer on that question, um, you know, for the purposes of this conversation, but, you know, it is an extremely important area that, um, you know, that requires a lot of attention and, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to, hopefully folks will, will be able to move that ball forward. Um, we have a question about um, these new technologies, autonomous vehicles, um, really big, um, fancy, sexy items like transit that are often getting a lot more attention um, in the public policy conversation than some things that we already know that work can be pretty cheap to put in, like walking, biking, walking infrastructure. Um, so how do we start giving those local investments the same weight politically and highlighting their value? Well, I think part of the reason that that autonomous vehicles get so much attention is because they are so tremendous, so potentially transformative. Um, and so, which isn't to say necessarily that that smaller scale investments and and biking and pedestrianization and and good land use aren't transformative. But um, you know, I, I I think that there's actually a really strong need for folks in our cities and in our communities to start grappling with the implications of autonomous vehicles because you know it's it's my opinion that we're really like the rollout of the automobile in the early 20th century we're only going to really get one chance to do this and so if we don't do it right we're going to be in big trouble so i i, I think i would push back gently on that score, which is to say that you know, figuring out how we do autonomous vehicles in ways that support our goals and, and don't undermine them is actually a really critically important thing. And in fact, that it's a place that folks who are doing work in communities and at the grassroots really need to engage in. Uh, we were involved in a process here in Massachusetts with our coalition partners at Transportation for America and a number of uh, nonprofit groups here in the state to start to investigate what are the what are the implications not just for transportation but for our communities uh, and our economy of this wave of new technologies and and that was a really um, important and informative experience because it brought different constituencies and different people into the room to start talking about this and visualizing what it might mean for our community so I push back gently on that um, but then you know I do think that there are you know one of the things I think that we are learning you know, every single day is we're learning about the implications and the negative impacts of uh, of auto dependence and about the potential for uh, for other modes of transportation um, in ways that I think you know have the potential to really resonate with the public. You know, we know that um, car dependence is making us sick in many ways. It's contributing to obesity and mental health issues. Uh, we know that it is making, uh, you know, it's obviously having an effect on our environment. We are learning a great deal about uh, the effects of automobile air pollution on people who live near 
busy streets and highways. Um, so there's a great deal of evidence out there, you know, and we also know from examples in, uh, you know, locally and around the world of how transformative and how positive um, moving toward a different vision for our cities can be in terms of transportation. So, you know, I think making that case, uh, you know, based on the merits and, uh, you know, and educating the public about it is, is also really important. I'm sorry, that was kind of a long-winded answer. I apologize. <laughs> Um, so I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Um, we do have a hand raised sure. from Joel at the Green Lining Institute. So Joel, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Well, now I don't see that your hand is raised. Just a second. All right, Joel, you should be unmuted now. But ours is Hello? Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I just had a question around um, the 50 steps. Um, so I focus a lot on you know, EV work and transportation equity more broadly and was wondering if you had any, you know, through your reports, any specific steps around increasing this carbon-free transportation um, services in low income communities and communities of color who, of course, you know, suffer disproportionately from the transportation related pollution and also who are typically the, le the least um, mobile. Just wondering if you had any um, comments around that. Right. No, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think all of these, all of these issues affect different communities differently and, and they're, they're significant, you know, when you think about particularly the public health burden of transportation um, and the economic burden of lack of transportation choices, um, you know, definitely low income communities are, are specifically negatively impacted. Um, I think that there's a variety of places in this agenda that, that can speak to that. Um, you know, particularly around uh, issues related to um, to public transportation and land use. Um, in the in the New Way Forward report, which was the one that we did in May of 2016, we tried to address this this question in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, one of which is to uh, you know to really begin to question where there are opportunities to use some of these tools, some of these new tools, in ways that we we haven't quite used them yet to address both. Um, you know, transportation and climate as well as, as, as equity concerns. So, you know, one example is, you know, in the shared mobility world, um, you know, whether it's car sharing uh, or, or other types of shared mobility sources, uh, services, we, we've tended to, con to conceive of those services as being things that are, you know, primarily delivered by the private sector. And so as a result of that, they have tended to be delivered in places where, you know, there's an effective market uh, to be able to, to make um, to make the bottom line work. And there really are, I think, opportunities to find ways to deliver those services, you know, either through nonprofits or through community organizations uh, or through governments in ways that can expand and improve mobility for folks in low-income neighborhoods. There have certainly been some great examples of nonprofit car sharing uh, around the country. And, you know, I think there, if you look at what some of the applicants for the Smart City Challenge have proposed, um, you know, they're really solutions that have the potential to kill a couple of birds with one stone, both to, um, you know, to address mobility uh, generally in a city in ways that are environmentally friendly and responsible, but also to expand access to, um, to critical public services and job opportunities. So I, I realize that that's kind of a glossy, you know, an overview answer, but, um, but I do think it is something that we need to think about, and you know, I think if you look back at the at the New Way Forward report, there are a few places in which we really did try to engage with that question of, um, you know, how can we use these services to address multiple challenges, including challenges related to equity. Um, so, Alana, I um, I think we should probably do we have any other questions? Because I think we will probably want to wrap up. I, I did want to ask people to hold the line for just one more minute for a closing. But are there any other questions that are out there? Um, folks did um, submit a few more questions and comments, and we definitely appreciate that. And a lot of 
people coming from uh, local battles on the ground and things that they're dealing with at a, a local or county or state level. So I think that's a good segue into where we go from here. Sure. And one thing that I, I, if people are okay with this, and you should feel free, my email is right on this last slide at Tony at FrontierGroup.org. So if you have any objection to this, you should feel free. But, um, you know, but I do think keeping this conversation going uh, is, and learning from each other's experiences and perspectives is going to be really important. So, um, you know, if folks have no objection, I, I would be happy to share some of, you know, some of those comments that we weren't able to air in this hour out to folks um, afterwards. But um, what I wanted to do just before we break um, and before before the hour is up, you know, is first of all just to thank you all for taking this time to join, to share your insights, to share your questions. Um, you know, I think we could continue to do this, you know, have this conversation for, for a little while longer if, if we wanted to. Um, and I also wanted to see to talk a little bit about how we can keep the conversation going. So after the end of this webinar, uh, we will send you an email within the next couple of days with an invitation to continue to be in conversation uh, on this topic. And we also want to hear from you if you have any ideas for how this work can be helpful to you in your efforts um, in the advocacy that you are doing on, uh, on any of these issues. Um, we're open to finding ways to uh, use this work to help support your work, um, to partner in any way, to find ways to make it relevant um, at the local and state level. And obviously, we, you know, we would greatly appreciate um, you know, your uh, using it as a resource in whatever ways uh, that make sense to you. So we will be reaching back out to you within the next few days about opportunities for that. In the meantime, uh, if you have any questions or if you have any ideas or if there's anything that you would like to share, um, please feel free to email me at this address, Tony at FrontierGroup.org. Um, again, and also you can um, follow the work that we do uh, both on our website at FrontierGroup.org, uh, on Twitter at FrontierGroupUS, uh, as well as on Facebook. So again, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you very much for coming out this afternoon, and have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, all.